That was um, John Lennon's Imagine, imagining a world without God being a much better place. Now, John Lennon should not be confused for the speaker tonight, who is called John Lennox, okay, just to make that absolutely clear. Hello, I'm um, Professor Daniel Chua. I'm head of the School of Humanities and also the director of the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative here at the University of, of Hong Kong. And it's wonderful to see all of you here. In fact, I wish the hall was a little bit bigger so we could fit more people in. And there are quite a few people watching online. So hello to you watching out there somewhere in cyberspace. H welcome from Look You Hall. So it's a pleasure to welcome all of you. And it's a pleasure to invite all of you uh, to switch off your mobile phones. Uh, and to switch on your brain for tonight's lecture, which I'm sure will be both riveting and relevant on the question of the relevance of God for the modern world. Now, in a recent survey of Hong Kong youth students, um, over 50%, the majority of you, believe that God is relevant. In fact, you even believe that God is good for the world. The world is a better place with God. But uh, a sizable number of you, over 40%, also believe that God is fictional, a human construct, something, a product of the human imagination. Now, I don't know whether any of you saw the wonderful uh, spoof of our poster, the, the parody of our poster. Our poster said, and a God is irrelevant, discuss. And there was this spoof that said, Godzilla is irrelevant, discuss. Um, it's a wonderful poster, so thank you whoever did that um, poster. And not only is it very witty, um, but also I think it raises a very interesting point, because if God is relevant, um, but if he's also um, fictional, then what is the difference between God and Godzilla? It raises an interesting point. So to help us to understand some of these issues about the relevance of God this evening, it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor John Lennox. John is a professor of mathematics at Oxford University, and he lectures uh, on mathematics, of course, and also on the history of science there. But he's not just a mathematics professor. He also, for example, lectures uh, in the business school, the Said Business School in Oxford. I think it's fair to say that he probably runs the most popular and highly commended uh, course on business leadership there. Uh, he's also written many books on uh, science and religion, and he's also a very skilled debater you probably know that he uh, famously debated the Oxford scientist and prominent atheist uh, Richard Dawkins of the God Delusion. I won't tell you who won that debate. You can go and check it out online if you want to find out. But we are going to test his debating skills tonight as well because we've left plenty of time for you to ask questions after the lecture. And because there are so many of you here uh, this evening, uh, I thought it would be too difficult to be handing mics around. So what we've done is we've put a mic on both sides, right at the front here. So if you have a burning question after the lecture, please run up to the the mic and then queue up, line up there, and then we'll take questions left and right, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can, because that's really the most exciting part, I think, of this evening, to receive those questions, and we'll try and answer as many as we can, although uh, John does have to catch a plane tonight, so we'll definitely end uh, on time. Anyway, because there's not much time, I better stop uh, rambling on. So please put your hands together and give a good Hong Kong you welcome to Professor John Lennox. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you very much for inviting me to this distinguished university. And I am very glad that we have been able to make clear at the beginning that I am not John Lennon. <laughs> Although I have written a song which is also called Imagine. I will not sing it to you. But I want you to think about it as I talk. It's Imagine a World Without Atheism. Now, I am very grateful to those who undertook to conduct this survey because I found it so fascinating that I scrapped the lecture that I had already prepared to give you, and I decided I would start the Q&A at the very beginning of the lecture. <laughs> In other words, I am responding now to your reactions to the questions that you were asked, and then we shall open it up to uh, the audience and the people behind will referee, and we shall, I hope, come to some interesting things to stimulate your thought. 
The topics are about the relevance of God. And as you, if you look at the survey, you will see that it's the bottom two that really ought to be the focus of this evening. The agreement with the idea that science and human reason now explain what God once explained, and the agreement with the idea that God is a concept created by humans. Although I found it very interesting to contrast those statistics with the fact that very few of you thought that the world would be a better place without God. And using a bit of logic in that, it shows that many of you think the world is a better place even if God is a fiction. So we'll have to analyze some of these ideas, but being a pure mathematician, I'm very interested in definitions. The word relevant comes from the, the Latin relevare, which means to lift something up, to lift it out and therefore distinguish it as important relevant to the matter, pertinent to the matter in hand. And of course, the title is incomplete because you cannot use the word relevant in a sentence without adding relevant to what. For instance, when I'm teaching algebra in Oxford, God is not relevant to that particular enterprise. And when you're dissecting the innards of a Boeing uh, turbojet. God is not relevant to that. So we've got to ask, relevant to what? Because something can be relevant to some things and not to others. Many of you are students, and what you're learning now may or may not be relevant to the exam you're going to sit next week. What you're learning in your classes today is probably not relevant to the concert you're going to go to tomorrow night. And then there are interesting things that are relevant in ways of which many people are unaware. Because I'm a pure mathematician, people think my subject is, first of all, non-sociable, secondly, abstruse, recondite, and of no real interest. So I talk to them about the square root of minus one. And I say, aren't you glad about the square root of minus one. And they say, what's the square root of minus one relevant to? And I ask them to pull out their smartphone. And I say, you wouldn't have that had mathematicians not come up with the idea of imaginary numbers and therefore were able to solve the wave equations and all of electronics, all of mass communication, the internet and everything else is dependent on the concept of an imaginary number, even though a large percentage of the world's population is blissfully and completely ignorant of that wonderful fact. So there are things that are relevant to your life that you know nothing about. So this business of relevance is a complex thing. There are also things that will be relevant that you do not immediately appreciate. When you were learning Chinese characters in school, I bet you some of you found it painful. I would find it impossible. I keep saying to my younger British friends, if I were young, I would have a go at learning some Chinese characters. But now my brain is completely collapsed, or nearly, so there's no chance. And I bet some of you found it painful, but then when you've done it, and you discover that it opens up the wisdom and the literature of China and its philosophy and history, you now see that what was seen to be irrelevant and painful is immediately relevant. So the business of relevance is a bit complex. I know many people that in their student days thought God was completely irrelevant, and now their lives are based on living in this world for God. So their relevance concept has actually changed on the way through. Now, I'm not going to, I never do answer questions in the way in which they are put, because that's boring. So we're going to have a look at the questions in a different order. And we're going to take first this question four. God is a concept created by humans. Now, I've just given you a concept created by humans, the square root of minus one, and it's very relevant. So the logic 
of the conclusion is actually not quite good, is it? Something is not necessarily irrelevant because it's created by humans. There are many things. I mean, I've come through Hong Kong. I've noticed a large number of very, very complex and tall buildings created by humans. The structure of those buildings is highly relevant to your safety as you walk along the streets below. So things created by humans can be enormously relevant. But when it comes to the question of God, the idea of God being a fiction and therefore relevant is not satisfactory, and in particular, it is not satisfactory to my antagonist, Professor Richard Dawkins. As you know, he's written a world best-selling book called The God Delusion. And he holds that because God is a fiction created by humans, belief in God, faith in God, is not only a delusion, but a pernicious delusion. That is a dangerous delusion. The Nobel Prize winner, Steven Weinberg, a physicist, says the world needs to wake up from the long nightmare of religion. Nightmares are, of course, delusions. And we need to realize, as he says, that science can get rid of God, and in fact, he adds, the best thing we scientists can do for the contemporary generation is to eliminate God altogether. There speaks a physics Nobel Prize winner. Now, what is a delusion? It's a persistent false belief based on strong contradictory evidence. And so Richard Dawkins puts a God in the same category as Father Christmas. Now, that's a pity, really, because he's not thinking straight. When I was a child, I believed in Father Christmas. I no doubt some of you did. And then I discovered Father Christmas was a delusion. But I didn't make public the fact that I'd come to that conclusion, because I found there was certain financial benefit in holding on to the belief. <laughs> now, I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever met an adult who came to believe in Father Christmas? I haven't. I've met many adults who've come to believe in God. And Dawkins ought to be aware of that and not trivially put them into the same category. So, we need to look just a little bit at this business. Of course, it goes back to Sigmund Freud. The idea that God is a delusion was something that he made popular, and it has perpetuated into the modern age. So, let's have a look at it a little bit. Of course, if God does not exist, then we can reasonably put him into the category of delusion. And there's a recent bestseller has appeared in Germany by Manfred Lutz, who's a distinguished psychiatrist. The book is called Eine kleine Geschichte des Größten, A Brief History of the Great One, that is God. And Lutz is very interesting because he says this. He says, now, if there is no God, Freud can explain belief in God, and in my case, Christianity, as wish fulfillment. It's obvious I desire a father figure in the sky. I'm too weak to support myself, so I need to project my imagination into some kind of father figure in the sky. But then Lutz goes on, and he says, of course, if God does exist, the exact same Freudian argument shows you that atheism is a delusion, a projection of the idea that we do not wish to meet God. And his bottom line is very interesting. He says, as to the question whether God exists or not, Freud can give you no help, and neither can Jung or Frankel or any psychiatrist. You'll have to look elsewhere. So the Freudian argument works both ways and it cancels itself out. There's a beautiful example of this in which I was involved. Um, Stephen Hawking was asked what he thought of a religion, and he said, religion is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. 
And that appeared in The Guardian in London, and I was asked by The Times, I think, to make a comment. And I said, do you want a brief comment? Oh, they said, yes, please. So I said, atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. <laughs> well, I'm glad you laugh. That's very kind. But uh, it's, a clever, it's, a, it's a clever comment. It doesn't prove anything, of course. The trouble, ladies and gentlemen, is this. When Stephen Hawking says it, people believe it. Because he's using his vast authority as a scientist to make a statement that has nothing to do with science. Not all statements by scientists are statements of science. That's simply a statement of his belief. So I, as a scientist, said the exact opposite. And so we neutralize each other and we all go home. No, we don't quite because the question bears further investigation. Now, another little principle from this debate. Delusion is a psychological term. Indeed, it's a psychiatric term. And so I notice that Richard Dawkins is not a psychiatrist. I also notice I'm not one either. So in the academic world, when you are faced with this kind of thing, what do you do? Well, you must, must, consult the experts. So I decided to consult the psychiatrists, and I decided to go to the very top, the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, Andrew Sims. What did he say about the delusional nature of faith in God? Well, he wrote a book not long ago on this very topic, and his conclusion is this. The statement that all religious belief is a delusion is both erroneous, that is false, and innately hostile. Now that's what a psychiatrist says. Now Dawkins claims to be scientific in this debate, but he hasn't consulted the experts, and that disqualifies his whole position. Because this is a top psychiatrist, it's actually much more interesting than that, because he also tells us about the evidence for the well-being and human flourishing that proceeds from believing in God. Now, that's very interesting, and it's related to question two. The world is a better place without God. And I suspect that many of you will agree with what I'm about to say. Certainly, the statistics show it. But in the world of epidemiology, and I come from a college in Oxford that's world famous for epidemiology. Its first warden discovered the link between lung cancer and smoking, and we know the effect that's had on the world. And studies have been done to see if there's any correlation between belief in God and well-being. That's a hard thing to define. And all these studies have been collected together in what is called a meta-study, a study of studies. And Andrew Sims points out the result of one of the biggest as published in the American Journal of Public Health. He says this, in the majority of studies, religious involvement is correlated with well-being, happiness, life satisfaction, hope, optimism, purpose and meaning in life, higher self-esteem, better adaptation to bereavement, greater social support, less loneliness, lower rates of depression, faster recovery from depression, lower rates of suicide, fewer positive attitudes to suicide, less anxiety, less psychosis, fewer psychotic tendencies, less criminal activity, lower rates of alcohol and drug abuse, greater marital stability, and so on and so forth. Now, this is a massive scientific study. And Andrew Sims then says, if the results of this study had shown the opposite trend, that there was a correlation between lack of well-being and religion, it would have hit the headlines in every newspaper in the world. But because the correlation goes the other way, he says, and I quote, this is the best kept secret of psychiatry. So if you want to ask about scientific, in the social sciences, investigation of this, the evidence is mounting 
that belief in God is not health neutral. It's not well-being neutral. It is actually positive. Now, I rush to say that doesn't prove it's true. In fact, you only get proof in the strict sense, ladies and gentlemen, in my field of pure mathematics, as you mathematicians will know. But we use well, the word proof in two ways. The rigorous way in mathematics, you don't even get that kind of proof in physics or any of the natural sciences. And the informal way, for example, in a court of law, can we demonstrate that beyond reasonable doubt? We talk not about proof, but about evidence, about pointers. And that does not, of course, mean that what we believe is necessarily weak. I cannot prove to you mathematically that my wife with whom I've been for 45 years, loves me. I cannot prove it to you mathematically, but I'd stake my life on it because I believe the evidence is there. Do you see the difference? And so, although the link between well-being and belief in God does not prove it, it's powerful evidence pointing in the direction of this statement. If there is a God who created us and who loves us, and in whose image we are made, then it's not surprising if believing in him and trusting him brings about a state of well-being. That, at least, is perfectly consistent. So, let's come very quickly to the next question. And I hope you're writing down the things you want to ask. I notice some of you are, and I'm pleased. Science and human reason now explain what God once explained. And many of you agree with this. It's almost equal agreement and disagreement. So this is obviously a very important topic. And I'm interested in these statistics because Stephen Hawking has recently become very clear on this issue where he was vague before. And he says that we must, as intelligent people, choose between science and God because science now explains what God once explained. For instance, in the Greek world, they observed thunder and lightning. And they didn't like thunder and lightning because they thought it was evidence that the gods were angry. But of course, if you've done atmospheric physics at Hong Kong University, you will know that it's got nothing to do with the gods. It's to do with electrical discharges, static discharges in the atmosphere, and all this kind of thing. So, exit the gods. Science explains, and God disappears. And very often, as a mathematician, I am faced with the famous statement of Laplace. Laplace was a mathematician, a French mathematician, and he was once um, Napoleon came and was looking at his famous Mécanique Céleste, which is a brilliant book of celestial mechanics. And Napoleon looked learnedly at these calculations of the motions of ballistic missiles and said, where is God in your equations, Mr. Laplace? And Laplace answered, je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse. I don't need that hypothesis. And many people say to me, there it is, I don't need that hypothesis. But just a minute, Laplace was perfectly right. As I said to you at the beginning, when I'm talking about the way in which missiles move under gravity coming from Laplace, I don't talk about God either. Because the question was about how these ballistic missiles move. But if the question had been this, Mr. Laplace, how is it that there exists a universe which is describable by mathematical equations? the question would have been very different, wouldn't it? And the answer might have been different. You see, the relevance of God depends on the question being asked. Now, I want to investigate this because it is such an important issue in my university, and I've just been traveling around the world, and at every university virtually I've been at in the last two years, there's been a crowd as big or bigger than this. Because people are very interested in these topics. And they feel, because of the statements by Dawkins and Hawking and so on, that science and religion are in conflict. And we want to be scientists, we want to be regarded as intelligence, so let's forget about God. But that is 
completely false conceptually, and it ought to be obvious. Let's think about Stephen Hawking, the world's most famous living scientist. He has not yet won the Nobel Prize. I hope he does if they discover actual evidence of Hawking radiation that he predicted, he'll get the Nobel Prize, I'm sure. William Phillips did get the Nobel Prize in physics in the United States. So here are two people at the top level of physics. Their physics doesn't divide them. They agree on the physics. Hawking's an atheist and Phillips is a Christian. So that ought to show you that science and belief in God cannot be essentially in conflict, but it ought to show you as well where the conflict is. The conflict lies deeper. It lies in at the level of our worldviews. Hawking's worldview is atheist, and he is essentially a materialist. That's a very old view. The idea that ultimate reality is mass energy, to put it in modern terms. That's all that exists, and therefore, all explanation at the level of science must be reductionist. It must be bottom-up, because if there is only mass and energy, everything, including you, must be explicable in terms of physics and chemistry. Bill Phillips is a Christian, like me, and I believe the exact opposite. I do not think that mass energy is the ultimate reality. I think it is a reality. But I believe the ultimate reality is an intelligent God who created and holds the universe in existence. So now this is the other way round. It means that mind is primary and mass energy is derivative, whereas my atheist colleagues believe that mass energy is primary and mind is derivative. That is a conflict of worldviews. And it's important to see that, ladies and gentlemen, because everybody in this room has a worldview. Maybe as students, it's not completely formed, but you're asking big questions about ultimate reality, questions about the meaning of life, where we come from, where we're going to, what happens after death. And the way you answer those questions will shape your worldview. And it's helpful to observe that there are really only three major families of worldviews. The one is materialism that I've just explained. There is no God, there's only matter and energy. The opposite worldview is theism that believes there is a creator God who is distinct from his universe, but created it and upholds it. And the third worldview is pantheism. It is the view that you will find, for instance, in Hindu philosophy, where the universe and God are essentially the same, but not ultimately personal, impersonal. Now, roughly speaking, most people fit in somewhere in that spectrum. So we, none of us, approach these questions neutrally. And what I want to suggest to you, that if we look at it at this level, we can see why some leading figures are saying what they're saying. So let me face this question. Why is it that people think, as in question three, that science and human reason now explain what God once explained? Well, it's first of all because they're confused about God, and secondly, because they're confused about science. Let me try and argue that briefly to you. You see, if you believe that God is like a Greek God who disappears when you find the explanation of lightning, if you define God in that way as a God of the gaps. You know, I meet people who say, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Well, once science has explained it, exit God. From there, ah, but they'll find God somewhere else. So God is a God of the gaps. If you define God as a God of the gaps, then by definition, you've defined God in such a way that you have to choose between God and science. It is very important, ladies and gentlemen, in this debate, to ask my atheist friends, as I do, and Richard Dawkins got quite angry when I did it to him. He wouldn't mind me saying it. You can see it on YouTube. I said, the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in either. 
You don't believe in a God of the gaps, neither do I. I believe in a God of the whole show, who's the creator of the bits I don't understand and the bits I do. And Isaac Newton's a good example, isn't he? When he discovered his law of gravity, he didn't say, wonderful, I've got a law of gravity, I don't need God. No, he didn't. He wrote the most brilliant book in the history of mathematics in which he said, I hope this book, Principia Mathematica, leads many people to believe in a deity. The more he understood of science, the more he believed in the genius of God who did it that way. And that's the way we work, isn't it? The more you understand of engineering, the more you can admire a bit of, well, it's now German engineering, a Rolls-Royce. The more you understand of art, the more you can admire a Rembrandt, not the less. So the more I understand of God, the more I admire his genius in doing it that way. So I don't believe a God in the gaps, and there's the first atheist objection completely gone, because their argument doesn't touch the God who created the heavens and the earth. But secondly, there is great confusion about the nature of explanation, ladies and gentlemen. You know, at school, I learned the law of gravity. And at university, I learned how to derive the motions of the planets from one equation with about eight symbols in it, Newton's second law. And it was so exciting that Newton had thought of this compression into eight or nine symbols, ideas that were derived from Kepler's brilliant observations and conclusions that the planets moved in ellipses, and you could derive the whole thing from that single equation. A law of gravitation, but I made a mistake. I thought I knew what gravity was. But I didn't, and I still don't. You see, the law of gravity explains how to do calculations of bodies moving under gravity. It doesn't tell you what gravity is. Nobody knows what gravity is. Nobody knows what energy is. Nobody knows what time is. I wish I'd been taught that at school. It would have made lessons much more interesting. But then the teachers didn't know it either. That's the problem. Even though I come from Northern Ireland, they didn't know it. So, this is very important that we realize this. A scientific explanation. We need to be so careful to ask at what level is it explaining? But there's more. You see, well, let's take, I see many Toyota cars here, but I'll have to use a Ford. You've heard of a Ford car, haven't you? So, let's suppose there's one sitting there and you can all see its engine. And I say, we're going to investigate this Ford engine, and I'm going to give you two explanations of it. Number one, the law of internal combustion and clever mechanical engineering. That's explanation one. Number two, Henry Ford. Please choose. And you say, don't be silly. Oh, but that's exactly the mistake that many atheists are making. Now, you can see that explaining the Ford engine in terms of a law and a mechanism and explaining it in terms of Henry Ford, those explanations do not conflict. They don't compete with each other. They complement each other because they're different kinds of explanation. The one is an explanation in terms of a law and a mechanism, scientific explanation, and the other is an explanation in terms of a personal agent. And to say that science and God are mutually exclusive is the same kind of nonsense. To claim that God is a creator, the creator of the universe, is an agent explanation. That doesn't stop us from doing the work of science, and now comes the thing that we forget. Where did modern science come from? Atheism? No. It arose in the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe from a Christian background. And philosophers and historians of science have mainly come to the conclusion that the two are closely connected. C.S. Lewis put it brilliantly when he said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in the lawgiver. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not the least bit embarrassed or ashamed to tell you I'm a scientist and a Christian. 
because Christianity arguably gave me my subject. It's interesting, isn't it? It's the exact opposite of what Hawking and Dawkins are saying. They're saying belief in God hinders science, is a threat to science, will intellectually cripple you, and yet the great brilliant luminaries of science, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Clark Maxwell, Charles Babbage, the father of computing, were all believers in God. It didn't hinder them. It was the motor that drove them. And that raises another interesting question. Why would you do science? Oh, but you say, science can be done. I believe it can be done. I've got a good brain. I've got a good mind. I can do it. Oh, so you have faith then, have you? Oh, yes. The new atheists have played with the public and given them the impression that faith is a religious term and it means believing where there's no evidence. False on both counts. My faith in God is based on evidence. We can talk about that later if you wish. But it's so important to see that scientists are people of faith. You wouldn't spend years trying to solve a mathematical equation, as some of my colleagues have brilliantly done, if you didn't believe it could be done. If you didn't believe the human mind was capable of doing it. But why would you believe that? Now, that's a very interesting question that is now being catapulted into the middle of the debate. Let's think about it. What is my mind that's doing science? Well, my atheist friends tell me it is the brain, full stop. Okay? And what is the brain? Well, to cut a long story short, they tell me the brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process that did not have it in view. Okay? Just thrown up in the cosmic lottery. The permutations inherent in the basic molecular structure of the universe. Now, I put it to you students. If you knew that your computer that you're going to use for your examinations tomorrow was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? Not for one second. Why do we trust this then? You see, here's the very interesting thing. These atheist friends of mine are arguing in the name of science that there's no God. But now when you remove God and take the atheist materialist view, you discover that you've removed a great deal more than God. You've removed the basis for science itself. That's a very interesting notion, isn't it? It's actually removed the confidence that I can have in my mind to do the science at all. That's the reason I reject it, ladies and gentlemen, because I love science. That argument has absolutely nothing to do with God. It's to do with the fact that the worldview, this reductionist worldview, materialistic worldview, goes too far and ends up by destroying rationality. Now, you see, we come back to Newton. The reason that science burst onto the scene was because they did believe in God. They had a reason, at least in part, to trust their mind because they believed whatever processes had come about to produce human beings, they believed that ultimately the source was an intelligent God, and he was the source of the universe out there. So it's not perhaps surprising that the human mind in here can understand a bit about the universe out there. That at least is consistent. So I find that my Christian faith gives me warrant for trusting in God. So it's a very interesting thing as I discover um, arguments which seem very plausible and yet they end up by destroying the very thing you need to trust in order to do your science itself. Now, that's not a proof. It's simply a pointer. And it's my answer to the question that science and human reason now explain what God once explained. The question simply leads to that basic misunderstanding, both of science and explanation, of God on the other hand, and of uh, the nature of the subject matter under discussion and the status of the human mind 
that is doing the science. Now, let me make a few comments on the question of the world is a better place without God. Now, <clears throat> very few of you agree with that. That I find striking because the number of students, I believe, who would agree with that statement is at least 10 times what it is here in my own country. Uh, recent surveys have showed it's increasing and it's increasing rather rapidly. And it's the force of Dawkins' argument. And it is very much the force of the arguments of the late Christopher Hitchens, with whom I debated these matters a couple of times. Dawkins actually says that faith in God is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. That's a fairly totalitarian statement. Now, the first reason he thinks that faith in God is pernicious is because he redefines faith. He believes that I believe in God and I rejoice in the fact that I've no evidence at all. Faith is believing where not only is there no evidence, you know there's no evidence. That's nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. That is blind faith and that is dangerous. It's that kind of blind faith that causes young men to fly large aircraft into tall buildings. Now, I have to ask myself a question, and I must answer it as a Christian. Other faiths, quite rightly, must answer for themselves. And I ask myself this question. Is my Christian faith like that, blind faith? Or is it evidence-based, as is your faith in your science, evidence-based? Well, in order to discover whether it's evidence-based, the best thing to do is to go back to the original documents. What do they say? And let me give you an example. The Gospel of John, the fourth biography of Jesus, is very clear on this because John tells a whole lot of incidents. He relates them. And when he comes to the end of his book, he says, many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. So what John is saying, I've chosen these incidents. They are the basis for believing. In other words, here's evidence on which faith can be placed. So Christianity's own confession of its own nature is saying it's evidence-based belief. And I wouldn't stand here for a nanosecond if I didn't think that Christianity was based on solid evidence at many levels, first historical and second experimental and third philosophical. So it's not blind faith. But their second objection comes from John Lennon's song. Imagine, imagine a world without religion. Wouldn't it be marvelous? And I think it's he or someone else, and certainly many people, who point to my home country of Northern Ireland. I come from a family that suffered bomb damage and terrorism because my father was so convinced that all men and women are equal in the eyes of God that he employed Catholics and Protestants equally, and he got into trouble from both sides because of it. I was very fortunate that my parents were Christian and not sectarian. I was even more fortunate that they allowed me to think. But many people say to me, just look at Northern Ireland. I'll never forget when I got to Cambridge last century, roughly in the middle. Um, <laughs> a student at dinner said to me, do you believe in God? And he said, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, I'm so sorry. I forgot you were Irish. <laughs> he said, all you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. And of course, I'd heard that many times, but you know, that changed my life. Because I asked myself the delusion question. My parents were Christian. My grandparents were Christian. My great-grandparents were Christian. Well, of course I was a Christian. It's Irish genetics. <laughs> so I decided on that day in Cambridge that what I'm going to do is get to know people of other religions, get to know people who are agnostics and atheists, and I've been doing it ever since. And to really get to know them, that is by befriending them. 
and finding out what makes them tick. I've been doing that all my life, mainly in Russia and in Eastern Europe, where systematic atheism was imposed on a large section of the population. So, here I am, coming from that country, and I still believe in God, and I face Richard Dawkins saying, but look, religion causes war. It causes all this kind of stuff. How could you possibly believe it's good for the world? Well, here's my answer. I faced this many times, so before any of you ask it, I might as well answer it. What do I think of the violence in my country? Now, it's more complex than you think. It's not only a conflict of faith, but let's just accept the popular view for a moment. What I think of it is I'm ashamed of it. That's what I think. Utterly ashamed of it as an Irishman. I'm ashamed that the name of Christ has ever been associated with an AK-47, a petrol bomb, or a real bomb. But what I want to explain to you, ladies and gentlemen, is why I'm ashamed of it. I'm ashamed of it because people who take up weapons to defend Christ or his message are not following him. They are disobeying him. I once discussed this with Christopher Hitchens. I said, Christopher Hitchens, Christopher, if you realized what Christ stood for, like you, he was against religion producing violence, the exploitation of the poor and the elderly and so on. If you really understood, you'd be on his side, not against him. So we had a long discussion about this. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, 20 centuries ago, Jesus Christ was put on trial in, Je in Jerusalem by the Roman procurator. And what was the charge? Terrorism. Here's the irony of the thing. The new atheists and many others accuse Christianity of terrorism. And Christ was put on that charge. Was he innocent or guilty? That's a crucial question. And Pilate interviewed him said, what sort of a king are you? Because he was frightened stiff. And Jesus said this, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would be fighting. No, my kingdom isn't of this world. It's not that kind of kingdom. To this end was I born. And to this end I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And Pilate said, perhaps not cynically, what is truth? And he went out and said that Christ was innocent. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't it clear from history that the one thing that you cannot do is impose truth by violence, especially if it's the truth about God's love for human beings, his sending, his coming into the world in the person of Christ who died to take upon himself the sin of the world and to bring us forgiveness and peace with God and a new life. You can't impose that truth by pointing a gun at people. It's an absurdity. And so history's verdict is no. So my fellow countrymen who misguidedly took their guns and their weapons weren't following Christ. They were disobeying him. Now, the trouble with counterfeit money is this. Its existence assumes that the real stuff exists, but can make it harder to find. And it's true of many of my friends I discuss these things with, because they've been badly burned by a negative experience, they feel that they've encountered the real thing. And very gently, one has to explain but you see, the new atheists blame everything on God. But what about atheism? Imagine, sang John Lennon, a world without religion. But what about a world without atheism? The 20th century has been the bloodiest century in history, and I've been a lot of time in, the, in Siberia and many a Russian intellectual has said this to me. We thought, John, that we could retain a value for human beings and get rid of God, and we discovered we couldn't. 
Now the thing gets very serious, ladies and gentlemen. How is it that Richard Dawkins, with his knowledge of the world, can say he cannot imagine an atheist bulldozing a cathedral like Chartres or Notre Dame? I gave a lecture at the Polish Academy of Sciences this, and they stopped me, and I could see that there was a lot of irritation in the room, and I stopped and said, what's wrong? They said, send them over to us. I have stood by many huge holes in the ground, and a rather clever East German um, thinker said, well, Dawkins is technically correct. Cathedrals are too big for bulldozers. Stalin and Ulbricht used dynamite. 67,000 churches knocked to the ground, I think is the number. What about the record of atheism? Now, just as in the God delusion, there is no mention of the psychological evidence of the health-bringing properties of belief in God, also there's no evidence of the damage caused by atheism. It's all caused by religion. Now, of course, there has been damage caused by religion. I've just given you an example of it. But we must retain a sense of proportion. And it seems to me the God delusion is not serious when it comes to that question. The other thing is this. And it's the final thing. We've asked questions about the relevance of God. I believe that God exists and is real. And the question I ask, actually, and you'll allow me to ask a question, is what relevance have I got to God? That's a big question, isn't it? What are you as a human being? Are you simply the byproduct of the cosmic process that has no mind and no purpose? Or are you made in the image of God? Let me simply tell you what that means. If this is true that you are made in the image of God, that means you have got infinite value. You're not just another species. You've got infinite worth. And I don't know anyone in the world, I've never met anyone who was honest that's not interested in their own value and relevance. We've been talking about the relevance of God, but now we've got to talk about what relevance have I got, tiny little me, in this vast sea of humanity? Have I got any relevance? That's a different matter, isn't it? It's one of the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I am a Christian. My relevance to God starts by the fact that God has created me in his image, and that gives me a tremendous dignity. Just think what the world would be like if we all believed that about each other. That every person I meet is made in the image of God. I would be very careful how I treated you if I believed that, wouldn't I? And you'd be careful how you treated me. Anybody can see the relevance of that belief it's a magnificent idea because it empowers the poor as well as the rich. It empowers the intellectually gifted as well as the less intellectually gifted. It empowers people who've got maybe something wrong with their psychology or their health. I was asked the question today in Hong Kong Poly U, why are we here? And my straight answer to the question was because God wanted us to be. And I reminded them, I've got three children and seven grandchildren, and one of the saddest things is when children come home and say, Daddy, they didn't want me. Perhaps you've known that as a student or even a grown-up, feeling that exclusion from the inner ring. They don't want me. What sort of a God is this that we're told about? Who wants me to be? And the final point, of course, and you can ask me about it if you want to know more, is that God, who is my creator, doesn't leave me simply like that. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I must confess to you, I'm not perfect. I haven't kept even my own standards, let alone God's standards. 
I believe in justice. I'd love to see justice. But what justice is going to say to me is another matter. And here is the wonderful thing. But it's a story for another time. That God is not only a God of justice, but a God of love. And the heart of the Christian story is that the Word, the God who created the universe, became human. And that he died. And that great mystery of his death and resurrection opens up vast possibilities. Because, of course, it proves instantly that death is not the end. And according to the New Testament, it establishes the fact that when Christ died, he did something that opens up the way for you and me through trusting him to experience that peace with God, that forgiveness that I mentioned before. But as I say, it's a subject perhaps for questions or another time. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, John, for a very uh, enlightening and provocative talk. Um, now, this is the University of Hong Kong, and so this is an open space for you to ask any question that you like. So don't be intimidated by any particular worldview. You please express what you want. There are, however, three rules I like to impose on our questions. So A, B, and C. A is please be articulate. Please have a question in mind before you ask it. Don't try to formulate your question as you are asking it, mumbling down the microphone. So please be articulate. Two, please be brief. That's B, be brief. Make sure your question is short, sharp, and sweet. Okay, this is not the time for you to give that lecture that you always wanted to give on religion. And thirdly, C, please be centered. Please focus on the issues in the lecture today. You may be worried about whether your pet poodle will go to heaven, but this is not the time to ask that question. Okay, please be centered on the issues today. So if you have a question, please come up there. There's a mic uh, on both sides, actually. So please come, and then we'll take some questions, uh, and then we'll answer several at a time. So. so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to collect a number of questions before I comment on any of them, and there's a reason for that. In an audience like this, I know that everybody is interested in other people's questions. And so we're going to collect some so that you and I can sense where the weight of the questions is in the room. So you go first and make it quick, and I'll write it down, and we go straight to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lennox. Um, thank you for talking about frames of reference and how they really affect how we look at things. My question has to do with when you were talking about the evidence uh, that lots of sci that uh, theology is sort of the base and the queen of sciences and, and, and forms all the other science sciences. Coming from Asia, how would you uh, place that argument since you can make a fairly clear argument that a lot of scientific discovery in China did not come from a Christian perspective? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Number two. Hello, I've got four questions, so maybe um, I hope I can make it clear. The first one is you mentioned about wars. Uh, just may I say one question per person, because oh. that's the only fair way of doing it. Sorry, one, okay? Choose one. Off you go. Uh, about um, how we should define a rational decision. I know that it is always easier to believe in God uh, that he created the world with wisdom. And, but some people, they have a stronger faith to believe that um, the world exists because of, um, because of uh, many coincidences. But is it rational to pick the one that is easier to believe? Uh, do you? Get what my question. I think so. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Is it rational to believe the easier thing? Okay, next. Uh, hi, Professor. I have a question hi. about 
uh, the analogy you gave early on in your lecture. Come near the mic and I can hear you better. I have a question about the analogy you gave early on in your lecture. Between, Which one? Uh, between buildings, imaginary, imaginary numbers, and God. Um, for the first two, there doesn't seem to be a necessary relationship between whether a thing is a human creation and whether it is true or not. For example, a building is a human creation, but it is true in the sense that it exists. Uh, imaginary numbers are human creations, but they are mathematical truths. God, on the other hand, if God is a human creation, then God is not true. In other words, God doesn't exist. And I guess that's what people like Richard Dawkins would say when, mean when they say that God is not relevant because they are human creations. So um, my question is on your analogy. Thank oh, you. yes, that's fine. Four. Hi. Uh, you, you present us uh, uh, findings from research study about the correlation between the faith in God and the well-being. And, and well, that, that gives a very strong evidence that well, God is indeed relevant to our life. But I, I wonder if there's, I, probably there's no, no uh, research studies about the uh, comparing the well-beings of the devoted Christian and devoted Muslims and devoted Buddhists, where there, there are differences between their well-being. So my question is, is the name of God relevant? Thank you. Hello, Professor. My question is, someone may think that not, the God is not relevant, but ghosts are relevant, Bu or Buddha is relevant, or uh, the cycle of karma is relevant. Oh, so what, do, you, do you have any response to them? Okay, number six. Hi, my question is, uh, does God create atheists? Sorry? Does God create atheists? What? Does God create people who do not uh, believe in God. Does God create atheists? Yes. Oh, okay, I've got you. <laughs> Does God create atheists? Okay, um, next. So my, my question has to do with well-being and happiness. Uh, while I would agree with you about that, what about the uh, many people who suffer from severe depression and right at the base of depression is all, nearly always come, come the questions about uh, God and you know, where is God evil? Okay. You can see that this is a great tactic, ladies and gentlemen. I just keep writing the questions till the time's up <laughs> and then I'll get on the plane. Okay, you're next. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm a Christian and I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. Yes. Would you like to just summarize all your points into one statement for the audience to take home tonight? Would I like to summarize them in one statement? Would you like to summarize the whole of gynecology in one statement? Yes. <laughs> Science and art and godly work. Okay. Right, next. Okay, um, thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Professor Lennox. And I got, since you mentioned about Greek gods, Hindi gods, and different gods in, yeah, your, sure. yeah, in your speech, so I was wondering what's your view of, you know, and as a Christian, like, what our view should be towards other religion and uh, their, their understanding of God. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your talk, Professor. My question is that... Just a second. Uh, is, is, uh, is God relevant to creatures uh, other than human beings? So, uh, and uh, in another way, if all humans uh, disappear in a day, all humanity disappears uh, one day, so would God be relevant? Is God relevant to other creatures other than human beings? And if human beings were to disappear, is God still relevant? Uh, this next one will have to be the last of the first tranche, otherwise we'll never get started. So you and the others, if you just sit down and we'll see if we've got more time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, my question is about what you said, um, that faith, your faith is evidence-based. And uh, first, I would like to know what faith means in terms of a universal understanding and also um, you know, disregard any kind of religion, but what faith is, and as well as the evidence. I, know, I want to know your personal evidence. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Now you can see the advantage of this. We've all got an idea of what's going on, although I bet you can't remember all the questions, nor can I, but that's why I wrote them down. Um, 
I'll not answer them in the order in which they were said, because you can see that they relate to one another. There were several questions about other religions and so on. And in fact, I suspect one, two, three, that's the main area. So we'll reserve that for a moment or two. Um, the first comment was that theology, as far as I was apparently saying, was based in the queen of the sciences. But what about uh, Chinese uh, developments and technology and so on, which are very famous, invention of printing and all the rest of it? That had nothing to do with belief in God. Now, this is a very interesting thing because it is a matter that has been studied. You see, there is a difference between modern science and the sense of abstract mathematical description of the universe and the invention of technology. And one of the world's experts on China was Joseph Needham of Oxford. He is the author of the distinguished, huge, many-volume dictionary of Chinese technology. Now, the interesting thing about Joseph Needham is he was a sinologist, he spoke Chinese, and his work still remains today very important. But he was also a Marxist. And for many years, he tried to explain why the Chinese developed technology, very sophisticated technologies, but never the kind of abstract science that we now call modern science. He tried for a long time to explain it on the basis of atheistic principles. And in the end, he couldn't do it. And this is what he said, not what I say. It's simply what I have found out from my Chinese friends and uh, in studying this question. And it's this, Needham says, I can only think that the difference lies in the fact that Chinese thinking lacked the central idea of a creator, one creator, who created the universe according to um, rational laws. Now, that's what an expert on China and in the language says. And you must do with that what you will. I don't know enough. I wish I knew more. But that is the one thing that many people comment on. Technology, yes, but not abstract science in the contemporary sense. Now, the next question was, it's easy to believe in God. Some believe in coincidence, and I take it you mean chance. Is it rational to believe the easy thing? Well, not necessarily. But it's not necessarily rational to believe the hard thing just because it's hard. The thing is, you believe what's true. And this is a very important distinction to make between ease and truth. Now, I, I find it interesting that you said it's easy to believe in God. In the world I live in, people find the exact opposite. It's very difficult to believe in God. And I'm interested not in whether it's easy or hard. I believe some things that are easy, that my life, wife loves me, for instance, as I told you before. I find that very easy to believe, but it's true. It's not false because it's easy to believe, and it's not true because it's hard to believe, and vice versa. So, it's very important that at the heart of our debate, we learn to ask the truth question. I'm not interested in religion or philosophy or anything else for that matter, unless it's answering truth questions, because I want to know the truth, but I know you do, because your motto is veritas et sapientia, isn't it? You've even got a Latin motto, which means truth and wisdom. So, you focus on one thing, and some people find it easy, some people find it hard. That, to my mind, is irrelevant to the issue of truth. Now, there was somebody asked me about imaginary numbers. They exist in some sense, but if God is a human invention, He doesn't exist. Well, I apologize to you. I mustn't have made myself clear, because the point you were making in your question is what I am trying to make. Some things are relevant even though they are human creations. But that is not adequate for God. Because the concept of God, if it means anything, is the ultimate reality that does exist. Now, this is immensely important, because one of the other questions, which I'll now relate to it, is the question of the ancient gods. Now, I did a debate just recently in the Oxford Union debating chamber. I don't know whether you've watched one of those debates. They're parliamentary debates. We all dress up in dinner suits, and we're very polite to each other, or we try to be. 
And uh, uh, on my side was, were uh, a couple of Christians, including Christopher Hitchens' brother, and facing me was an atheist professor of philosophy and two other atheists, and sitting in between them uh, was Richard Dawkins, who said he didn't want to participate, but he, didn't want, but he wanted to come. So to my amazement, one of the major arguments of the evening coming from the atheist side was this, pointing at me, one of them said, you are an atheist with respect to Zeus. And I nodded, yes, I'm an a Zeusist. <laughs> and he said, moreover, you are an atheist with respect to Artemis. Yes, I'm an a Artemist. And you are an atheist with respect to, and he went through a whole lot of gods, Ra, Bel, and all the rest of them. Now he said with a great grin, we just go one god more. <laughs> what a childish notion. Why is it childish, ladies and gentlemen? Because what they fail to realize is that every one of those millions of gods from the ancient world are material gods. You say, what do you mean by that? Because ancient Babylon, ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, and ancient Rome all had theogenies and not just cosmogenies. A cosmogony is, of course, a philosophy, a theory of the origin of the cosmos. A theogony is an origin of the gods. And you'll find as you look at all those gods, they have one thing in common. They are descended from the primeval stuff of the universe. Indeed, the Babylonian gods came from, or is it the Egyptian, a primeval soup, although they called it a sea. It's not a new idea. Urnamu. The God of the Bible is not descended from material. He created it. That is so important. Again, it emphasizes what I was saying in my talk. In, if you're debating this question, before you get into it, make sure that both sides of the discussion know what they mean by God. Werner Jaeger, the distinguished Oxford expert on this, wrote a book on the gods of the Greeks and the Babylonians that is actually something I'm very interested in. And he said, the Greek gods are stationed within the universe. They, they descended from it. The Hebrew god created the universe. They are not to be put in the same uh, line of business. Does God create atheists? Of course he does. They're delightful people, most of them. I count many of them, and I'm proud to count them among my friends, as, might I say, I'm proud to count people of many different religions, Buddhist, Confucian, Muslim, Jewish, as my friends. Of course I am. Why? Because they're all made in the image of God from where I sit. You see, if I believe this stuff at all, I've got to be consistent with it. I've got to apply it. I'll tell you something more. Some of my atheist friends can put me to shame. I see more care in some people of other religions than I do with some professing Christians. Why is that? Because everybody, whether they believe in God or not, is made in the image of God, and therefore is a moral being. I take that very seriously. And that is why, actually, if you investigate every religion, and I've done it, dozens of them, every philosophy, including atheistic philosophies, you will find the golden rule in every one of them without exception. The golden rule is do unto others as you would they did to you. Treat others in the way you expect them to treat you. And that is so important that we recognize that. So I'm glad you asked that question, did God create atheists? Of course he did. The thrilling thing to my mind is this that God has created us as beings capable of love. He hasn't made robots. I'm thankful that when I get home to my wife tomorrow that she's not a robot, a robot with a big iPad here with buttons on it, one mark kiss, and I press kiss, and, <laughs> and I get a robotic kiss. God could have made a universe like that, but he didn't. He took the risk, if I might put it that way, of creating beings with freedom to say yes or no. You cannot have love and trust unless you've got 
the ability to say yes or no. And that's why we've got atheists, and that's why we've got Christians, and that's why we've got people of so many different beliefs. It's a wonderful ability, the ability to say no, because it implies the ability to say yes. Have you got what I'm saying? So that this idea is something utterly fundamental to my relationship with other people. Now, um, let's see how we are going here. Um, there is a question about, and I, I look at it now, I just notice it. Somebody mentioned the question of severe depression. And in severe depression, people often have uh, questions about God. Now, I would like to, I'm not an expert. I've told you already I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm not about to pretend to be one. But I have read Andrew Sims's book, and he comments on this. And he says that people that talk about God being a delusion should have thought twice before they wrote that. Because delusion is always a word tinged with psychiatric illness. And he says that sounds very hostile and very cruel to people with psychiatric problems, maybe depression, for whom their faith in God is one of the central anchors of their personality. And Sims develops that. So that is really my only comment on this. Of course people have delusions about God. They've got false ideas about God. People in their perfectly right mind have false ideas about God. The answer is not to get rid of God. It's to get the right ideas about God. Because if, as I believe, God created the human mind and its psychology and all its complications, Trusting God is not going to make you any worse psychologically than not trusting Him. But this is a very sensitive area. And I would agree with Andrew Sims that calling a book The God Delusion was a very unwise and, in fact, an unkind thing to do. Because I do know many people in this situation who faith in God is, is very real to them. But I recommend uh, uh, that book to you. Now, um, I was asked to summarize the whole thing in one statement, and I can no more do it than uh, my questioner can do in the field of gynecology. Uh, that's the trouble, really, is we always want one-liners, don't we? And I can understand the question, what is the, what's the key message here? But when you came to Hong Kong University, you don't expect to sum up all your studies in one statement, do you? <laughs> oh, you're hoping to. Well, here's, you'd better get together with a gynecologist and sort it out afterwards. But, you know, there's a grain of truth in this. I, I'm sympathetic with it. What would I say as a, a, as a statement here about tonight? God is real, therefore he's relevant. And if that's the case, the most important thing in life we can do is get to know him. So there's a statement for you. You can go away and think about that. Okay. <laughs> now, what is faith? Thank you for that question. That is a very important question. So important, I've written part of a book on it, but that's shameless advertising, so I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> I've written a book just recently called Gunning for God. As a Northern Irishman, that's a very good title. Gunning for God. And it really is about people that use guns to attack God and people who use guns to defend God, and they're both wrong. But in it, I raise this question of what is faith? Because there's so much confusion in the world. Even, I discover, among believers in God. Some think that faith is something that just zaps you from the sky. Others think it's believing where there's no evidence. But I think we all know what faith means as a result of the financial crisis. We thought we could trust the bankers, didn't we? We thought we could have faith in them. Now, I have some wonderful friends who are bankers, so don't feel insulted at all. We need our bankers. But you know what happened. Once the trust was gone, the faith was gone, the markets froze because there was no evidence base to get them going again. Isn't that right? And they only came back into function 
very slowly as evidence was given that people were more liquid and so on and so forth. Everybody understands, because we're all affected by it, in our pockets mainly, what evidence-based faith means. The problem with the new atheists is they're constantly saying it's a religious word. It's an ordinary word. It comes from the Latin fides, which means trust, loyalty. And in life, you do not trust facts or people without evidence. Otherwise, you're a fool. Isn't that true? A child will have reasons for trusting its friends and its parents. When I go to ask for a bank loan, the bank manager doesn't say, of course you're going to have a million Hong Kong dollars. No problem. No, he says, where's the evidence? Where's the equity that I can trust you with this money? All of our human interactions are based on trust, and the depth of the trust is proportional to the evidence that's behind it. Isn't that true? It's exactly the same in the Bible. But the difference comes here. It's not a real difference. It's just that trusting facts and trusting people are slightly different things. Now, when I first met the lady who became my wife, I took in evidence uh, about her through my eyes. It usually happens that way, unless you're blind. <laughs> I saw her, and that was a lot of evidence. In fact, it was extremely powerful evidence. I couldn't take my eyes off her, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> and then I took evidence through my ears. She started to talk to me. What a wondrous thing is this, that she'll talk to me. And then all kinds of other bits of evidence built up over the years. And because I'm a mathematician and like to know the end from the beginning, I took far too long to make my mind up. So seven years after this, I asked her to marry me. Now, when I asked her to marry me, did I know everything about her? No. Did she know everything about me? No. But I knew enough to ask her to marry me. In other words, I didn't know everything. In one sense, I was stepping into a partial unknown, but not a complete unknown. Now, this is one of the best analogies for what it means to trust God. Because God is not a theory, ladies and gentlemen, if what I'm saying is true. He's a person. And God has revealed himself in the person of Christ, a human. We're humans. We can understand humans. So I first hear about him. I read about him. And the evidence is cumulative. It builds up until one comes to the point where I'm challenged by God through Christ. Do you believe that I am the Son of God, the Savior of the world? And I make up my mind on the basis of, my, of the evidence. And some of it is the evidence of experience. Of course it is. So that is what I think faith is. It's the exact opposite of blind faith. So I'm now going to come to the last question. And I hope you don't mind that because I've been uh, very busy for the last few days. I got a plane to catch tonight. And I want to at least to have something intelligent to say to my wife at breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> so I want to come to this last question, which was asked in three different versions. And that is, what do I feel, or what do I think, rather, about the different religions in the world? If religion contributes to well-being, and that has been tested in over several religions, the tests weren't particularly confined uh, to Christianity, does it really matter? There are all kinds of religions in the world, so why don't we just pick and mix? Well, my answer to that is exactly the same as what I've just been saying. Evidence truth. These are the criteria. Now, before I answer that question, let me remind you of my answer to a question two or three ago. I find, ladies and gentlemen, that when you're faced with the question of other religions, it can become quite sensitive. And people can get heated because they sense a lack of respect. Now, I want to tell you as honestly as I can 
that I greatly respect, my friends. I said it once. I don't need to repeat it in detail. That's my axiom. Men and women, whether they agree with me or disagree with me on these matters, I regard them as of infinite value made in the image of God. Secondly, you will find that the disagreements between religions by and large are not in areas of morality. I've just pointed out there's this whole um, big area of common morality. C.S. Lewis, interestingly enough, for a Chinese audience, called it the Tao, the common teaching of morality. And he wrote an appendix in his book, The Abolition of Man, which if you have never read it, you ought to read it, discussing all those common moral beliefs throughout world religions and philosophies. So the difference doesn't lie there so much, but there are very real differences. They lie in the area of the following question. If there is a God, on what basis can I get to know him? Now here, I'll have to be slightly simplistic, but only slightly. What I discover in studying various religions and philosophies, and even some versions of Christianity, is that religions are very like Hong Kong U. You've got to get into the university, haven't you here? Do you have an entrance yeah. exam? Yeah. Yes, and you have some sort of ceremony, and you're in Hong Kong U. Good for you and you're on the way. Now, Hong Kong U has many ways. Some of them are called physics, and others called chemistry, mathematics, applied bas basket weaving, and all the other things that you do in a sensible university. Now, there are wonderful professors, like Professor Chua. They're there to help you and teach you. But every student who's on the way, trying to keep on the way, listen to the teaching, is hoping to get a degree. All right? Just like a religion. There's some kind of entrance ceremony. You get in, and then there are priests and gurus and people who teach you and help you and encourage you. And the way tends to be a wavy line. One day you're up, one day you're down. That's true of students as well, isn't it? You go up and down, but you know at the end, and you can see it getting near and nearer, there are the final examinations. Oh, wow. Judgment day, yes? Now, the interesting thing is this. Professor Chua, as you see, is a delightful man. He would love you to get through that final exam. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> he, he, he'll do everything to help you get through that final exam, but he can't guarantee that you're going to. Because the whole system in Hong Kong, you quite correctly, is based on merit, isn't it? It's a merit system. And you have to satisfy the examiners. So the one thing you cannot be sure of, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you can't be sure of as you sit there, is whether or not you'll be accepted by the authorities at the end and get a university degree. Now, many people think religion's like that. In fact, I've asked the uh, representatives of almost every religion in the world, and they say, that's more or less it. You try to follow the teaching, we help you to follow the teaching, and then we hope that one day you will so satisfy the requirements of God or whatever that you will be accepted. But it's a principle of merit, so that by definition, you cannot know now whether you'll be accepted in the future. To do that would be arrogance beyond belief. As we know, when students come along and say, I'm going to get a first, and we look at them and remember what sort of homework they put in past week, and we try to deflate them a little bit. <laughs> now, the main reason I'm a Christian, ladies and gentlemen, is Christianity isn't like that. Dramatically isn't like that. Because, you see, as I look at the final judgment, I know, now I'm going to be very honest, this is a personal question in a way, and if you don't like personal answers, just go to sleep for a little while, because I'm going to give you a personal answer, as if I was just sitting with you in a room. I'm not a perfect human being. 
I know the rules. I haven't kept them. And I know that if I stand before God in any meaningful conception of the word God, that I'm going to come short. And that ultimately my sin and my failure will separate me from God. I know that. So how can I gain acceptance? Now here is what, and I must be honest because you've asked me the question, what to my mind is the genius of the message of Christianity. God takes the initiative and comes to me. He comes into the world and Christ claims his name is Jesus. I wonder, do you know what that means? It means Savior. You shall call his name Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. And the great mystery, but the great fact is this, that when Jesus died on the cross, he took John Lennox's sin on himself. Sin is a serious thing. We pretend it isn't. It causes death. We ought to know that from the multi-millions of people who have died in the world as a result of immoral behavior. We can see that. And I understand that enough to know that if God judged me and condemned me, I would have nothing to say. And the wonder of it is that God loved me enough to send his son into the world to die for me. So that if I trust him, he's going to be the judge. And if the judge says to me, you're forgiven, I would be a fool not to believe the judge. I remember speaking to one of the world's most powerful judges who was a member of another religion. And I spent three hours in a train and he asked me, what is the difference between you and me? And I got explaining this to him. I said, Mr. Judge, Monsieur Le Juge, because we were speaking French, I said, if I came to you and you declared me free in your court, would I be right to believe you? Would I be right to believe you? And he got really angry. He says, right to believe me. He said, I am the highest judge. If I say you're free, you're free. I said, that's exactly, sir, what I believe about Jesus Christ. He's going to be the judge of all the world. He says I'm free. Monsieur le juge, should I believe him? i never forget what he said. He said, there is a vast difference, he said. I am trying to please God to gain acceptance. You claim you have the acceptance. And then suddenly he said, I got it. I said, what have you got? He said, it all depends on who you think Jesus really is. I said, exactly. Now let me make one final point on this to make it utterly clear to you because this is massively misunderstood. Suppose I went to the girl called Sally, whom I've mentioned a number of times, I hope you've noticed, all those years ago and said, Sally, I would like you to be my wife. Now, here are the conditions of the relationship. I want to present you with a cookery book, Mrs. Beaton's Cookery. And I open the page at apple cake. I rather like apple cake. And I say, here are the rules. If you're going to make an apple cake, thou shalt take one kilo of flour, two kilos of sugar, etc., etc., etc. Thou shalt mix them together in a bowl, and thou shalt put the bowl into an oven, and thou shalt heat it to 500 degrees, and thou shalt wait half an hour, and you get an apple cake. Now, I said, of course, I wouldn't think of accepting you now. But if you keep these rules, let's say for 30 or 40 years, and you earn enough money on the side to keep me in the manner on which I, to which I'm accustomed, and you keep these rules, then I'll accept you. Ha! Huh. Otherwise, you go back to your mother. <laughs> now, what would you think of that as a marriage proposal? I would reject it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Obviously, you're the only one. <laughs> you would reject it. Of course you would. In fact, would I be right in saying that you'd be insulted by it? Oh, yes. yes, you would. 
Isn't it odd that millions of people think that that's the way you get related to God? You try to keep the rules in order to gain acceptance. You would never insult another human being in suggesting it. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very important thing to grasp. Many people reject the Christian faith because they've never understood what it's offering. What it's offering is something immense. It's offering a certainty now, an acceptance now, where you know you're going to be accepted by God in that day to come, because you have already been. Christ said this. It's a startling statement. Truly, truly, he said, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me shall not come into judgment, shall have eternal life, has already passed from death to life. And because he is the judge, it would be arrogance of me not to trust him. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm bearing my soul to you a bit. I'm explaining to you the fundamental motivation of my life. I'm not going around giving lectures about God in order to gain acceptance. Of course not. I'm going around giving lectures about God because I've got it. And likewise, my wife. My wife doesn't cook in order to gain my acceptance. That would be a slavery, and that's why many religious activities turn into a slavery because people are desperately trying to gain the attention of God. You imagine my wife under that system trying to cook an apple cake. Now, if I don't get this right, my husband is going to send me back to my mother. Ooh, I better get it right. So she gets so steamed up that she can't see, and she turns the oven up to 3,000 degrees centigrade. And out comes a burnt offering. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. I hope you see the point I'm making because it's so profound. That's what many people think religion is. And that's why it's turned into a slavery, and that's often why they reject it completely. But to discover that God is prepared to accept you as you are, that's a different matter altogether. So that's my answer to those questions. I have the greatest respect but in the end, I'm convinced that Christianity is true because it rings true at this level, and it gives me a peace and a forgiveness that I discover nowhere else. So that means this. Christianity, Christ, competes with no other religion. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean this, because he offers me something that I find nowhere else. Thanks very much for being such a good audience. Good night. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.